Thanks for the introduction, Kim. Um, I'm planning to talk for, I guess, about 30 minutes, something like that. And then we uh, maybe have a bit of a chat, a bit of a discussion about the themes that, uh, that I want to talk about. Um, our speakers earlier tonight have, uh, have dialed us back to the 1700s for uh, examples of, uh, of, of um, notable thought leaders telling us that perhaps we're not happier with technology, um, and indeed to the printing press. Um, I'm going to take us even back further a little bit. And to start out, what I want to do this evening is I want to talk about how people react to technological change. And there's different types of change that you're going to run into, and some of them leave more opportunity for reaction than others. So let's first of all imagine that you are a French soldier. It's the summer of 1346. It's been a nice summer, but Today, as you get ready with 25,000 of your colleagues to take on the invading English, it's starting to rain. It's a bit of a wet morning, but you're very, very confident. You don't have any worries about what's going to happen today. There's a big battle coming. There's 25,000 of you, and there's maybe five to 10,000 English troops that you're facing. What could possibly go wrong? You have it made. No worries at all. You form up in line of battle, you're ready, you've got your knights to the side of you, your foot soldiers, you've got archers, and then something very, very bad happens. The English start firing their arrows at you. And the arrows are coming down, they're hitting you, your colleagues are falling all over, and you're wondering, why aren't our archers firing back? And in fact, the French archers are firing back. But the French archers have crossbows. It's a standard bow that's used by the troops of the French army, and it's raining. The strings on the crossbows are wet. They don't stretch as well, and you can't stretch them any further on a crossbow. All you can do is crank it back as far as it'll go. The English have longbows, and the longbows are new technology. They're the greatest thing. They're the iPad 4 of the day. And they're outreaching the French, so the French archers can't reach the English, but the English are reaching no trouble at all, and their bolts are heavy and their armor piercing, and they're going right through. And by the end of that day, the English have suffered 100 casualties with their force of about 5,000. The French have been absolutely routed. 2,000 men at arms are down, and virtually all of the foot soldiers. It is a disaster. When you're faced with that sort of technological gap, can you decide to say, well, I'm not going to bother with that one. It doesn't look interesting. That doesn't you know, appeal to me. Can you afford to ignore it? You can't. You have to get with the program. It's right there. You have no choice. Let's dial forward to a different sort of technological change 100 years later. So, um, and I guess I should have jumped forward to our pictures of archers, but 100 years later, We've got people in universities much as we are here today. There's students, they're listening to lectures, um, probably that definition of a lecture being that process whereby the notes of the professor become the notes of the student without passing through the mind of either, still applies in those days as it often does today. Um, and the students are using books. Well, of course they are. There's not very many students in universities, it's for the elite. And it's an expensive education, in part because the textbooks, many of you probably find your textbooks kind of expensive right now. But in those days, those textbooks were really expensive, in part because they were prepared by hand. Monks in scriptoriums would produce these, uh, these wonderful, wonderful books. They were beautiful. Um, typical work for a monk would be to produce a Bible. They were gorgeous, absolute works of art. It would take many, many years to prepare one Bible, a monk might get to work on two in a lifetime. So you can imagine the cost. But there, just about 100 years after the Battle of Crecy, we're at 1440 now, Gutenberg comes along and invents the printing press. And with that, things start to change. They change very, very rapidly. But it's not a very scary change, because the monks in the scriptoriums are really not the most militant bunch, and they've still got their work producing these gorgeous books. But with the invention of that printing press, the rate of production comes up, 
the cost starts going down. Um, when we talk, by the way, today about uppercase and lowercase letters, I don't know if you know where that comes from, but if you look at the printing press there, there's a cabinet off to the side, and there's little holders for the movable lead type. And in the uppercase, they have the capital letters, and in the lowercase, they have the small letters. That's where we get the terms uppercase and lowercase from that we still use today. And this starts to produce the very first big data explosion. At the start of the Elizabethan era, there were eight million books in the world. Collector's items, a collector might have one or two. By 1600, there were 200 million books. That is an astonishing big data explosion, and it carried with it many of the challenges we have today dealing with the vast explosion of data. We think that what we're going through today is new, but they had to handle that as well at that time. Now, um, the, uh, the Vatican was, uh, was a major um, repository, but the big data storage uh, house of its time, the data center, and it was pretty easy to catalog. It's obvious what you would do. You catalog things into the sacred and the profane. What could be easier? Um, and this data keeps coming and coming, and people start producing books about things other than um, you know, the, uh, the religious works. So um, big thinkers of the day, Francis Bacon comes along and suggests that perhaps we need three categories, the sacred, the profane, and posy. Uh, posy, posy, what is that? Poetry, basically, a major form of the written word at the time, and that still doesn't cut it. The science keeps evolving, but nobody's feeling terribly threatened. In fact, this is more opportunity. I'm sure there was a few monks feeling put out, but if you look at what happened at that time, um, as the libraries start to expand, you find that there's a need to catalog. And so Cutter comes along and he says, okay, let's catalog whatever is in the library. And he comes up with a system that works very well, very efficiently for cataloging what's in the library. Dewey comes along and says, let's actually catalog the whole world, and as new things come along, we'll slot them into these major categories of science, education, religion, whatever. And today we have the Dewey Decimal System, and there's not that many people here about Cutter. So this is a nice, slow change that represents um, opportunity, and it hasn't changed. Today, one of my favorite, um, well, I guess it can't exactly describe it as a bad news scenario, but um, everybody's been making jokes about Edmonton today, and coming from Calgary, I'm not really allowed to do that, but I have to say that if I did come here and get caught in one of your snowstorms, being caught in a Starbucks with, um, in a chapter, sorry, a, a bookstore with a Starbucks would be just about perfect. Lots and lots of books, cup of coffee, I'm a happy guy. I feel terribly disloyal when I use my e-book reader um, because I feel that I'm starting to displace the books. But the changes are continuing as we go through. So that's one that hasn't finished by any means. So let's go from the present day back again and let's dip into um, the time of the Napoleonic Wars when we have the invention by Joseph Jacquard of the programmable loom. And the programmable loom is a fascinating device. It allows you to produce amazingly complex works of art in the textiles. And there's a picture here of Jacquard woven on one of these looms. This um, silk screen uh, weaving took 25,000 punch cards to program the loom. And it produced this fascinating work. And on seeing this, Napoleon realized that this was one of the pivotal pieces of technology of his age. Um, he awarded the highest civilian honors to Jacquard because it was going to revolutionize the textile industry. So what could possibly be wrong with something like this? Well, there's some great spin-offs from it. Um, the punch card technology that was used in the programmable loom inspired Charles Babbage in England to think up the idea of the very first computer. So Babbage starts trying to build this computer with the idea of using it to produce nautical tables, tide tables um, for the British Navy, gets funded by the Admiralty to do that, and actually builds a small working engine. It doesn't do a lot, um, but everybody's fascinated with the concept of it. It was to be programmable, 
It was to be powered by steam. Um, problems he had at that time were you couldn't buy nuts and bolts from, you couldn't buy nuts from one factory and bolts from another because there were no standardization. And all the mechanical difficulties made this thing impractical. But his design actually would have worked if there had been better engineering tolerances at the time. The Imperial Science Museum in London, England, has built a replica of the machine that actually does work. Now, programming it um, remained more or less a thought exercise, but Lord Byron's daughter, uh, Ada, Countess of Lovelace, Ada Lovelace, Countess of Lovelace, um, became effectively the world's first programmer. So any of you who noticed that uh, programmers tend to be uh, men rather than women, um, just remember that the very first programmer was a woman, and um, so there's, uh, there's a priority right there. So all this is spinning off from the programmable loom. That's great. It's wonderful, right? Except if you happen to be a weaver. Because suddenly, you can do astonishing work with a machine. And what happens? There is an uprising, led by Ned Ludd, who apparently wore very strange clothes. Um, the Luddites started fighting against the, mechan uh, the mechanization. Um, this was the movement in England. Um, we also have uh, similar movements in Europe. And for the scale of this, realize that the British army actually had more troops in England fighting against the Luddite revolutionaries than they had on the continent fighting against Napoleon. That was the scale of the backlash against a technology that threatened the jobs of a working man. So they could say no to this. It wasn't an arrow through your armor. It was a dreadful machine displacing the livelihood of people. And they weren't seeing the payoffs from it. So today, many people do work in factories doing perhaps rather uninteresting, unchallenging jobs. And I don't think anybody in this room today would want one of these factory jobs. But lots and lots of people do depend on them today. And we hear alarming stories um, of people being unhappy with these jobs. And I'll touch on, um, on some of the reaction um, to the loss of jobs like that later on. But we know that many of the jobs that require consistent, skilled work, heavy work, are now being done by industrial robots. When we see these robots coming in, we think, well, OK, we didn't really care much about those jobs, though lots of people did. And we don't really feel threatened by the robots. They're sitting on a production line. There they sit. Not too much of a worry. But um, if the robots start replacing those workers, and this is, uh, the workers in this uh, picture are actually from uh, one of the plants that's building iPads. Uh, and my presentation's running on iPad just now. Perhaps some of these folks built that iPad. Um, as we hear about multiple suicides within the factories, uh, unhappiness with uh, the working conditions, the um, factory that's building the iPads has announced plans over the next three years to replace one million workers with one million robots and obviously increase the production rates. So even the low-paid worker is now being replaced by the industrial robot, not just the heavy um, jobs. And what reaction will that bring? How will these people react? So hold on to that thought for a moment, and let's talk about another trend. And then we'll tie this all together and see what this might mean for society today and what our responsibility is as people involved in this change. So one of the projects that Cybera is working on, my, my group, is uh, building the world's largest radio telescope. This is an astonishing project started by a professor, uh, Russ Taylor, at the University of Calgary. Now involves uh, 20 countries and a budget of 3 billion euros to build a telescope that effectively will turn one hemisphere of the Earth into one giant eyeball staring out into space. The center of the arrays, uh, called the square kilometer array, because that's about the size of the array, the center of the arrays will be in two locations, one in South Africa, one in Western Australia, in radio quiet deserts and spiral arms will snake out across the Pacific, um, covering much of the southern hemisphere, and giving us views back to the very beginning of time that we couldn't possibly have imagined before. 
from the point of view of my group, the really interesting bit is that this is going to produce one petabyte of data per second 24-7. So my group manages the flow of data at the moment from the Large Hadron Collider, where we're doing large particle physics, but much of that data gets filtered at the time of the experiment, and only in the interesting parts get past the Atlas detector and move out to major sites like Triumph in, uh, in British Columbia. The data for coming from the large, large the square kilometer array is such that we don't know what's in that data. We don't know what we don't know, so we don't know what we're looking for. How does the spin rate of that pulsar relate to the chemical composition of that nearby nebula? So we can't throw any of it away. That data set is so large, it is fundamentally intractable to the human intelligence. So what do we do about that? Well, we go beyond human intelligence. I want to take another little tangent. Let's look at a little critter here. Um, this is a beautiful little organism called a sea squirt. And the sea squirt, in its larval stage, swims around in the ocean, eating things, having a nice life. And at some point, it decides it has to grow up and settle down. And it finds a nice rock, and it attaches itself to the rock. And for nutrition, until it can turn into this beautiful creature that waves its fronds and filters from the, uh, um, from the stream of water going by, uh, it eats its brain. Now, why would it eat its brain? Um, basically because it's an available source of nutrition and it's not going to need it. Because if you don't move, you don't need a brain. And that's something that hasn't really informed artificial intelligence research up to now. We've tried to make intelligent computers that sit in labs and don't go anywhere. They don't experience the world, and they don't really develop very good brains. I studied artificial intelligence back in the 1970s in Edinburgh, and I would have sworn at that time that we would have all the major problems, machine translation, voice recognition, nailed by about 1980. And boy, would I have been wrong. Um, we're getting a little closer. I'm quite hopeful, but I've been hopeful since about 1980, so you may not want to count me on that one. But when I saw um, the IBM supercomputer playing on, uh, on Jeopardy, beating the humans roundly um, in unstructured questioning, it made me realize that we were actually getting closer to computers having the ability to act and think like humans. But this still is a very limited domain. Ultimately, what you want to see is a computer passing what's called the Turing test. And I suspect, given this audience, that many of you know the Turing test, but the Turing test, named after a British mathematician, Alan Turing, basically, Alan Turing was trying to figure out what is intelligence. And he said, if we can't tell the difference between a machine and a human, we must either conclude that the machine is intelligent or the human is not. And given that we postulate that the human is intelligent, then if we can't tell the difference, then we must tell, say that the machine is intelligent. There's an annual prize um, called the Loebner Prize um, for trying to pass the human um, intelligence test, the Turing test. Um, it's pretty limited, but each year, if you look at the results, it's getting more and more um, likely that we will pass in the general domain rather than in specific ones. In fact, these days, sometimes you can tell it's a computer because it's too good. It's way ahead of the human in many areas. So if we start pulling these themes together, Let's think about what happens with the robots once we start making them intelligent. If I show you a picture of a big robot like this that's designed to be a pack horse for the military, you go, okay, it's a big robot, it might be interesting. I don't really care about the robot. But we have a habit of thinking of these things in terms. So if you look at the robot being tested as it walks across an icy surface just now, and check it out as we look at the balance on this big dog robot. And it gives it another kick again. It almost falls over, catches itself, and it writes itself. Great, nice engineering. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel when you see the researcher kick big dog? Do you feel anything for the robot? I suspect that some of you do. I suspect that many of you do. Um, we can have our feelings manipulated. We can tend to put our ideas of what we think is a living thing on something that moves around. So 
if we're going to start to anthropomorphize our machines, then how are we going to feel as these machines become us? Are we going to see this as a positive trend, such as the work that's being done to help amputees control uh, prosthetics just by thinking? Or are we going to see it in terms of the scary robot from the movies? Because the scary robot from the movies is the predominant way that the media portrays the future. It makes more interesting news. Just as I said earlier, we tend to focus on bad news rather than good. Um, where is this all taking us? So, we've talked about some models of change. We've talked about the change that you can't avoid. It's coming at you, you have no choice. We've talked about the gradual change. The introduction from the printing press, something that's positive. And we've talked about scary change that takes away your job and you try and fight back against it. So as we get into this period of artificial limbs, printing organs, implants in our brains so that we can think of things without having to look at our devices, how will we react to this change? One way that we might react to this change is to simply put our own interpretations on and deny the experts in the field. So I came across this delightful um, children's uh, education piece that tells us about the history of dinosaurs going back a full 6,000 years ago from when they were created to present day. Um, very few of us would find this good educational material for our children, and yet there are people who firmly believe that this is the truth and everybody else is wrong. Well, okay. Um, then others who are just plain wrong because they haven't thought through um, the implications. So Jenny McCarthy um, speaks on matters of science with not the, um, the training of a uh, physician, but um, the voice given to her by being you know, a very pretty young lady who appeared in Playboy and that gave her a national platform and when her uh, son turned out to be autistic, she looked around for things that might be the cause and decided that it was due to vaccines. Uh, some very faulty research, but with a platform given to her by being a celebrity, has got lots and lots and lots of people convinced that vaccines cause autism um, without any data to back it up, and as such has convinced hundreds of thousands of people, um, reproduced now through television shows and so on, to not vaccinate. And we start to face problems as we lose herd immunity um, and diseases that were once close to being uh, gone come back. So how do we get our science information? Where do we go with it? And lastly, um, whether it's manipulation through a religious idea, manipulation through ignorance, or manipulation through actual malfeasance. Um, I mentioned the... Um, um, earlier on that um, these things are open to misuse. So back in uh, 1980, I was working for an oil company in Libya, um, looking for oil in the desert, and the, uh, just having a bit of a dispute with Colonel Gaddafi. Colonel Gaddafi claimed a large part of the Mediterranean, and he wanted his people to be very scared of the Americans. And the way that he did that was took news footage of um, a serial killer who was working in Atlanta, Georgia, killing uh, babies. They were all part of the black community there. Um, and the authorities had figured out the killer himself had to be black because there was so much racial tension that there was no way the white guy was getting near black children at that point. This guy had killed many children. And um, so the Libyan TV station took footage from ABC, NBC of black people being frisked by white cops at various checkpoints um, and said, the Americans are coming, you can see their ships on the horizon. When they get here, they're taking you off to labor camps and your children will be of no use. 
cut away to the picture of the murdered children, they'll just shoot them. All this with American TV pictures, but with an Arabic voiceover. And being denied any other source of information, it was compelling. I would go out the next day, blonde hair, blue eyes, and people would throw things at me. Um, it was astonishing to see propaganda in modern times, relatively modern times, modern times for me, perhaps not for some of you who weren't born at the time, um, but we're not talking the 1940s here, um, being used to manipulate people by giving them false information. So we can take this technology, we can celebrate it, or we can deny it, we can push back. But I have to ask, what is the responsibility that we as people involved in technology have? I would suggest that we have a responsibility as those who have the privilege of being at a university, of thinking about the future, of learning about how technology change has happened in the past, about seeing how it's going forward in the future, to get out there and help our fellow citizens, many of whom don't have this privilege, to understand that the future can be a force for positive change, that it doesn't have to be the scary thing that takes away your job, that threatens your livelihood, that with every door that closes, many new ones open. If we don't do that, we can expect to see pushback against the technology. And make no mistake, the people who want to push back against the technology, the folks misusing it for propaganda, the celebrities trying to push their own agenda, the forces trying to push a particular dogma, use the modern tools very effectively. When I was at a meeting recently of the AAAS, there was a great question asked to the audience. Um, the speaker said, how many of you in this audience have published scientific papers? Lots of hands went up. He said, okay, leave those hands up. If you've also um, written uh, a blog, and lots and lots of hands went down, but many people were blogging. I said, okay, great. Now, how many of you have actually put together video materials to put forward your ideas, your specialty of science, to make it accessible to the public? And almost every hand went down. Kim, of course, would be able to keep his hand up because he does a marvelous job with his video blogs. But most of us don't tell our stories compellingly. We think that we will learn about the future, but we stay within the academic community. We don't engage our fellow citizens who are not all getting this opportunity. And make no mistake, innovation doesn't just happen within the ivory tower. The most innovative person on your block might be the hairdresser down the road who's doing something entirely new and different. We have to get out there, we have to tell our story, whether that means getting our um, stories told on NOVA, um, or whether it means making sure that our social interactions help spread the word to the other groups. We have a responsibility that goes beyond just engineering the future, but also to represent it and help it move forward in a positive sense. I hope you'll all do that. Thank you. So that was really great talk. I'm sure there are questions. Who would like to start? Uh, yes, Earl. Uh, Robin, the issue that I'm grappling with is that there is no consistent pattern forward. That is, um, um, in a way, what you have portrayed is a, a kind of um, historically measured model for us. But in fact, um, sometimes things take two steps forward and one back before they move ahead again. Yep. Uh, do you have any way of dealing with that in terms of trying to develop your own ideas? Well, I think that the central theme of being advocates for the positive side of change and reducing the fear amongst those who don't have the opportunity to see that bigger picture is a big part of exactly that. Um, we will see ourselves take two and sometimes three steps backwards if we don't um, get out there and do that. Uh, I think that another thing that we have to watch out for as we uh, develop in terms of society um, with our um, 
understanding of the future and its implications is to make sure that all of us get to participate. Um, along with working on great big radio telescopes at Sibera, part of what we're doing and what, part of what we do today is run the high-speed research and education networks within this province. Um, we see a situation where there's a society building up of digital haves and have-nots. Um, if you're in Edmonton, you probably have access to all sorts of things. But if you're going to the high school in uh, Vulcan or Three Hills or Troshu, if you go home at the end of the day as a high school student with an assignment to look up things on Wikipedia, uh, Google, whatever, and you live in town, that's great. You can do your homework. If you go home to a farmhouse a couple of kilometers out, you immediately have a little more than dial-up if you have that at all. So we tend to think of the future as being here. But I love the statement, uh, I think it's from Gibson, that the future is already here. It's just not widely distributed. Um, that kid going home to the farmhouse is not going to be able to do their homework the same way. We need to fix that. We need to address it. Otherwise, we will have those two groups. And that's not conducive to moving step by step forward. That'll help us move two steps back. In terms of um, telling your story, I guess one of the things I've just become aware of and become quite concerned about is the role that policy appears to be playing in preventing scientists from actually explaining what they're doing if they're working for particular organizations that I'll leave nameless at the moment. Um, how do you envision that perhaps the scientific community might be able to transcend those kinds of artificial limits on really connecting with those of us who are not perhaps scientists? Sure, and, and that's a great question, thank you. Um, there's a number of areas where we're starting to see a real change in the policy um, drivers. So if you dial back, just let's, uh, we don't have to go back to 1346, let's go back 10 years. Um, policy makers tended to make their decisions, um, set their direction based on ideology because they didn't have data. If we look at, for example, the oil sands, we're in Alberta, let's look at the largest industry here. Um, there's people who say the oil sands are wonderful because it's creating jobs and producing trillions of dollars of in, uh, income for the province. There's those who detract and saying that there's dreadful environmental impact. And to the large extent, those people are going without data. Um, so, again, one of the things Cybera is working on is saying, let's take the expertise in terms of data, um, gathering sensors, which are now becoming cheap. Almost all of us are now carrying sensors, sensor packages, GPS, accelerometers, you name it, um, in our pockets. We've sensor-enabled the world just in the last 10 years. Getting all that data together and turning it into something that's aggregated so it becomes information is something that we've been working on as we try to pull together things like the Water and Environment Hub that we've been building, and then allowing people to do the analytics, to turn that information into knowledge is an area that we've also been working on by making compute available. And ultimately, we'd like to make compute available as a utility within this province, within this country, so that you always have the computing, not just the network, but the computing available you need. If you can go from data to information to knowledge, then ultimately the last step is policy, and that's where you go to wisdom. You can do that data-driven decision in a world where you have open data, open source, ultimately open government. But unless you have that, you can't get that policy through. So it really is a matter of pushing for the openness, and we're starting to see some really positive steps in Canada and around the world uh, as governments do open up. There, there are many areas of uh, technology that in a sense are hardly regulated at all. Uh, nanotech at the moment, uh, there aren't rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are rules in medicine. Um, where do you see the dynamic in terms of regulation? Should we be worried more about reducing it in the areas that already have it? or creating it in the areas that don't have it? Uh, where, where, where should one put one's priorities in that sphere? You know, I'm going to link to the last question, which is uh, in, in terms of policy. Um, the more information that you have, the better policy you will make, and that will give you a better regulatory environment. If your regulation comes from ideology, you have real problems. And I'll give you a couple of examples of, of goofy regulation. 
Um, I mean, the classic one from quite a while back was the Indiana um, uh, Pie Bill, where the um, state legislature in Indiana decided to legislate that pie would be 3.2 because it would be more convenient. Um, that's, um, that's really quite alarming, but that was quite a while ago. But um, recently, a judge in the Philippines uh, granted a, a divorce to a woman who uh, um, came before the court and uh, argued that um, her marriage was no longer valid because her husband had become gay because he had walked through a field of genetically modified wheat. And um, <laughs> the judge, on talking to some visiting scientific experts, simply wanted to know the mechanism whereby the genetically modified wheat you know, turned people gay as they walked through the field. He wasn't questioning. He knew for a fact that was that. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, state of Mendocino County in uh, California recently uh, legislated that DNA is a protein. Um, the worse the uh, information, the worse the regulations. So work on the openness of data, the flow of data, and you get good regulation where it's required, and you have the confidence of policymakers to back off when it's not required. Yeah. We, we have in this course, a way, in, in a way, a kind of uh, uh, complete freedom to do so many things. We can't possibly do them all. Do you think we, we have our priorities in the right place? Or, for instance, a, a lot of the lectures are medical in the sense that we have defined it, but not the way most people would define it. Probably only a quarter of the lectures contain medicine that you have to go to medical school to understand. Mm -hmm. um, we, we seem to be teaching a unique course. We, we don't want to waste the opportunities that come from this course. Do you, do you think we, we should be focusing on areas different from what we have focused on thus far? And if so, what areas? Hmm. Um, that would be very presumptive of me because I think that you're, you're the, uh, <laughs> the, the driving force here and I think you're doing an amazing job. I would say that I share the view that medicine is becoming a uh, information science. Yes. And um, if that's the case, then I think that you're probably right on the mark in terms of preparing people for the future. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, folks like Shauna are actually developing their surgical skills because we might very well need them before the robot steps in. But uh, the future <laughs> is changing and changing rapidly and preparing folks for that future is, um, is commendable. Yes. Well, at the moment, I guess our motivation, which has gradually evolved, um, we're trying to make the course as diverse as it can be while, while still, still maintaining the general focus, getting bright ideas from people out there in the world who, who, are, who are known to be the best thinkers in this area and then mixing them with local talent. And some of the local talent are people who are not particularly well known, but we have, for instance, uh, the Dean of Arts and uh, Dean of Science. We're thinking of going after uh, the Dean of Medicine next, mm -hmm. um, so on. Um, it, what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, we, we, we have a, a myriad of ways in which we could pursue the, the people who would be new lecturers. Uh, should, should they be people that everybody's heard of, or should they be maybe the unknown who, who has something unique to say? I, 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 I would look to the TED model. Um, yeah. The fact is that, uh, I think we were chatting earlier with one of your students um, who had signed up for a computer science course um, as one of the new massively open online uh, um, courses. Um, those are something that's popped just in the last year and a half and are showing that there is a huge appetite for a diverse education um, where the interests are stimulated, the thinking is stimulated. We're in a world where, um, quite different, Kim, you and I, when we were in school, we had to memorize a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And yes. that's just not the case anymore because 
why would you memorize all these things that you can look up so easily? Um, the world's changing fast. And I think that if you engage the curiosity, then you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So big names, hmm. um, I'd rather hear interesting ideas from the, uh, you know, the, the everyday to the great um, without reference to whether or not they've won medals or whatever. Right. Yes. Um, make sure that they're fascinating ideas. Right. Don't let them run too long and you're great. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very, very much. I think we, we should go on now to the student presentation.